Hello. <laughs> How are y'all doing today? Excellent. Somebody, so you got to be doing uh, a little sleepy. That's right. Second day of the conference and uh, right after lunch, you know, it's getting that tired. So I, I hope to keep you entertained for a little bit. Uh, my name is Spencer Schneidenbach. I'm here to talk to you today about making uh, a maintainable ar code architecture in um, ASP.NET Core. Uh, just to specify, I'm not going to show you an architect of, like, architecture of like a huge system, right? I'm going to show you how you can structure your code for maintainability and for separation of concerns. We're going to talk about all those things. So first things first, you can find me on Twitter at Schneidenbach. Uh, as I always say in my talk, just because uh, the conference ends doesn't mean that our relationship ends. You tweet me, email me anytime, get a hold of me. You can also go to rest.schneids.net. Rest.schneids.net has links to this presentation. I gave it at NDC. They were kind enough to record it. Um, it has links to uh, the articles that inspired these talks, including the precursor to this talk, uh, as well as a surprise that I will tell you about at the end. Okay? So take a picture. Don't try to remember my, how to spell my name. <laughs> All right, um, so let's set the stage a little bit, right? Um, you work at a company, right? I mean, most of us work for somebody. How many .NET developers in this room? I've already asked that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could have guessed, right? Um, so you work at a company. Your boss, your program manager, whatever, comes to you and says, hey, we need a new uh, RESTful API. We need a new single page application, and we need to back it with something, right? We want to do React or Angular, and we need an API to back it with. Or one of our consumers, one of our outside customers, really wants to consume some data from an API that we have, right? Or for some data that we have. So you say, okay, great. Well, we're ASP.NET developers, or most of us are, right? So you turn to ASP.NET Core, um, because that's the newfangled thing, and that's cool. Or maybe you're turning to old, I don't know what they call it. I, I heard it described as legacy in an article that I saw it described as legacy in the article the other day. And I'm not ready to call it legacy yet, but whatever, the previous version of ASP.NET, right? Not ASP.NET Core. What I'm teaching you today, all the examples are in core, but with a little finagling, you can get this all to work with just a little few code changes. You can get this all to work in old web API, right? So it's not specific to core, but you know, that's what the examples are in. So you turn to this, right? And then you say, well, what's the first thing I need to do to go from zero to make magic happen, right? That's a huge thing that uh, is really important to me, right? As a, an API consumer and a creator, I want to make it as simple and easy as possible for you to get started doing whatever it is, doing some magic, right? Getting some JSON to come through an API, right? I want to make that as quick and painless as possible. And so does Microsoft. Microsoft wants to provide all this great tooling, all these great templates to, do, to help you, to help facilitate that. And that's awesome. And this is important to you too because you just want to get stuff done, right? You're working for your company. You want to move quickly. So what do you turn to? You turn to scaffolding. Scaffolding. How many people here are heavy Visual Studio users? Okay, a lot of .NET developers, so I'm going to narrow it down a little bit. How many people do ASP.NET day-to-day or have, okay, well, okay, a good few amount of hands. Now, how many people have taken advantage of scaffolding? They right-click, add controller, they give it a model, and it just spits out a bunch of stuff for you. Right, it's awesome, right? Scaffolding is cool, it's amazing, it's productivity, it's awesome, right? You just right-click on a controller, you say, hey, I want to create something for the employee model. Um, and so you just right click, you select the employee model, and then all of a sudden it spits out some controller with a bunch of actions, right? And if you back it with Entity Framework, it makes it even easier. Because then it just says, oh, well, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to call, make these database calls in order to make this happen. Scaffolding is amazing, right? It's awesome. It's kind of magical, right? I already used this GIF in another presentation, but it's so relevant. It just feels like magic. Scaffolding just is like, I create it, I start my project, and all of a sudden I'm getting JSON through my API, right? So let's take a tour of what scaffolding looks like. We need to know about the scaffolding experience in order for me to tell you more about why, how awesome it is. So first, uh, I want to introduce you to the employee object, right? Let's pretend that you're working on a payroll system or something, and it's got some basic information, right? It's a ID, first name, last name, some, some other stuff, uh, social security number. Oh, but wait, I'm, a, I'm not in America. I'm in Poland, right? So social security number not really relevant to you. So we'll just call it the, uh, the Pezel number, Pezel. I don't know how you pronounce it, but is, is that, is, let me ask you something. Is that, is that sensitive data? It's social security number in the United States is very sensitive data. So you have to encrypt it. There's a lot of standards around. Is that sensitive data? I wasn't able to figure that out. Yes. Yeah, good. Okay, so this, this example is extra relevant. So since I'm in Poland, we'll call it the Pezel number something. 
All right, so the employee object, part of a payroll system. It contains sensitive data, social security number, PESL number, whatever you want to call it, right? So it's got some, it's got some usefulness, right? Because employees are relevant to um, outside systems, right? Like a HR system, you might need to integrate with an HR system, or you might need to display the employee on a web page. And it has some sensitive data about it, so you have to kind of treat it, you know, a little gently, right? You have to be, you have to be nice with it. You don't want to maybe, maybe there's a business requirement, right? You don't want to get it with Git requests, something like that. So you, the developer, you love Visual Studio, Studio, you love getting stuff done, right? Your goal is to give value to your company. So you want to move as quickly as possible, and Visual Studio has great tooling, it really helps you do that. So you turn to ASP.NET Core and Entity Framework, or ASP.NET Web API and Entity Framework, or ASP.NET Web API in a database. Could be nHibernate, right? It could be uh, Dapper, Petapoca, whatever, something. It's right at the front of it is ASP.NET Web API, at least for the purpose of this talk. These are the things that you choose. How many Entity Framework people here? People use Entity Framework. Okay, good amount of you. So that's good, good, and, good and relevant then. It's probably my favorite data access framework. So you first go to File, New Project, right? And it, and it looks kind of something like this. If you've, if you've chosen something, um, if, you've, if you've made a new template, right? You go File, New Project, and you say, I want a new web API. Uh, this is what you'll end up with. And it looks pretty familiar if you've done ASP.NET Core in the past, or ASP.NET. You've got a controller, so you've got models where you would store your employee model. Controller would be the, uh, the place where it, the uh, HTTP requests are kind of represented, correct? Um, so you've got, a, you've got this nice view of the project, right? But you do have that controllers folder, which we'll come back to in a second. So you've got also a startup CS, right? So this is kind of the replacement for global.asax. Um, and, and, and you do have startup CS, or a, a kind of, it's a little bit different, but you have one of those if you're using um, Owen or something inside of your ASP.NET Web API project, right? You have a startup.cs. This is the entry point for your application. This is kind of like the main method, right? And it's got a few things. It's got a few interesting things, right? You've got um, a place where th this, is, this is basically your, this part of the startup CS is the dependency injection part. This is says, these are the services that are available for my application to use. So we've got add MVC because nothing, absolutely nothing is opt, is opt in automatically or opt, opt out, I should say you have to opt into it explicitly, right? So you have to actually add MVC services to the project. And Microsoft designed that very particularly. If you run a web request through system.web, through web API, it goes through a bunch of handlers before it tries to do something. Microsoft said, let's make everybody opt in, so that way, if they don't need the services, they don't have to have it, and they can scale better, right? So you add MVC, you add the, these MVC services. This gives ASP.NET Core all the things that it needs to do to render razor views or handle HTTP requests. And then, of course, you've got some additional services that you might have, such as an email sender or something to send text messages. And, of course, you've got something like DB Context, which uh, allows you to add to your dependency injection pipeline um, the, the DB Context that you're using for Entity Framework. Entity Framework's just my example du jour. So you add that and say, this is available for our application to use. Okay? And then you've got, of course, you add your employee model. right? You add that right to the models, because that's where they say it should go. right? So far, so good. So then you've got your employee model, you've got your DB context. Now the magic happens. Now this is where it gets magical, right? You right click on controllers, you go add, and you go to controller. And then this, you get a dialogue that looks something like this. You say, oh, do I want to scaffold up uh, some kind of razor views um, with these controllers, or do I want to scaffold up an API controller? And you're like, well, I'm making an API. I want to do an API. So you select uh, API controller with actions using Entity Framework. Again, this is all really cool tooling that Microsoft provides you. And then you get this dialog, and you select your model. And you say, this is where the model that I want to use, this is the context that I want to use, the DB context that I want to use, and I want to call it employee controller. And then what do you get? You get a cool employee controller. And look what it has in it. First things first, it's got a, few, it's got a couple of things if you're making an API. This looks a little different, right? If you're used to ASP.NET Web API or MVC, you have a couple of attributes here. One's called produces, right? It says that I want to serve JSON because if you're making an API, you may serve XML, but more than likely you probably want to serve JSON, right? It, you know, modern days and JSON means modern, right? XML doesn't, right? No, that's, that's just a joke. That's a fallacy. But for the sake of this example, JSON it is. So then you say, well, here's the route that I want to point it at. So when I go to my website, AP, slash API, slash employees, I'll hit the employee controller. And then look at that. That's cool, okay? So when you scaffolded before, it would just instantiate its own DB context, right? Well, Microsoft said dependency injection is a first class citizen in ASP.NET Core, so we're actually gonna inject it as part of, as part of the constructor. 
And that way, something else provides it the service, right? Inversion of control. And that's good, because that means it's not responsible for instantiating itself. You can mock it. You can test with it easier. So you get some good benefits out of that. So Microsoft took sca scaffolding and made it a little better, OK? And that goes back to this, right? This dependency right here, application DB context, was created right here, right? It was added right there. So now it's part of the dependency injection pipeline. ASP.NET Core is aware of it, goes in, everybody's happy. Cool. All right, so that's good. You get a few other methods, right? So typically, you want to get a list of things. You want to be able to get a, an individual object. You want to be able to uh, update that object, create ob new objects, and delete them. So first things first, you've got a couple of git methods that go through. And they say, well, here, this is where you get your list of employees. There's a nice method for it, right? That just rep represents a git request to API slash employees. Pretty cool. So then you got the same thing below it, except this time you're only getting a single one. And if it exists, you get a 404. If it exists, you return it. Otherwise, you get a 404. And you have the same thing for posts. Uh, this is just the, the method that you would use to, oh, I'm sorry, this is a put. This is the method that you would use to update an existing object in place. Note a couple of things. Note that you're using the same entity to post in as you would actually use to store the object. We'll come back to that. That's relevant. So put requests, typically used for updates. Uh, then you have your posts. Posts are used to create objects, and it's very simple. The lines of code are very simple. So far, so good. All right. And then we have, of course, our delete, which would, would delete the object from the database. Or if you use deleted flags, you might set deleted equal to true or something like that. Uh, ASP.NET just assumes you want to remove it. That's good enough for us for now. OK. Again, getting back to the promise, like with just a few clicks, You've created a bunch of stuff, right? You've created awesome amount of code. And it's and it's works. If you do, if you run your project, then you can do git requests versus that. You can do gits and puts and posts to that API. Scaffolding is amazing, right? It's productivity. It's awesome. But I'm here to tell you something, and that scaffolding is a lie. It is a lie perpetrated by Microsoft. As a Microsoft MVP, I can say this stuff. It's a lie perpetrated by Microsoft to fool you into thinking that you're being productive. But Problem is, is that scaffolding, while it's great to do quickly, has costs, has lots of costs, right? First things first, your controller becomes a one-man army. Your controller is now responsible for routing the request. It's responsible for validating it. Uh, I didn't go over this, but in the put in the post request, it's actually validating what you're getting is required, that, that the object that you're getting has all the required fields. You have to run the service for that request, so the controller is now responsible for actually doing the get or doing the create, right? And then it's responsible for returning data. The problem is the controller shouldn't be doing these things. The controller's not really, that's not really what the controller's good for. The controller is a really good traffic cop. That's what it should be doing. It should be saying, oh, you're a get request, you need to go here to process that get request, okay? So we're gonna do a refactoring exercise. I'm gonna break this down for you. The big problem is, the, the, big, the, the main problem is that there's no separation of concerns. Noth everything is, is stuck into one place, and the controller really shouldn't be responsible for doing all that. It should only route the request and return data. That's what it's good at. The other problem is, is that entities are also requests, right? So that employee object that we use to store and represent our data is also used to represent the request, right? The request that's being sent um, to either create the, create the employee, update it, or delete it, um, or get it, right? So it's all tied together, right? And that's, there's problems with that, right? We've got our employee object. Let's say that your, one of your business requirements is that you don't want them to be able to update the PESL number, or you don't want to be able to do a GET request. The only time you want to do, uh, have that PESL number be there is, to, is during posts. Maybe you just want to be able to create employees with that, and then that data disappears and never, never look at it again, right? Or perhaps you have other properties on this that are really only useful internally. Right? They're not really useful. They're not something that is really useful to a consumer or something that they should see. We all have objects like that that have lots and lots of properties or columns in the database that represent things that are just relevant to us. Right? So let's break it apart. Let's break it all down. So I'm going to show you how you can do that. So first thing that we need to talk about is the command query responsibility segregation pattern, which essentially says that requests are made and something processes, and the, something processes those requests uh, and then that data is returned, right? It's not, it just breaks apart the request and the processor, okay? Inherently, scaffolding does not do that. It ties it all together. So let's take a look at what that looks like. The bottom line is that we need to validate, we need to move the validation, the running of the service, and the requests to another part of our application, 
okay? And there's lots of reasons to do that, which we'll go over. Uh, reusability being the first one, right? If you break your services out into requests and queries, then you might have an opportunity to reuse those in other places. Maybe it's not MVC. Maybe it's something like a, I don't know, a WinForms application, right? You, you can't always predict how these services are gonna be used, but you know that they may be reused in the future. So if you want that, it's there, right? Uh, separation of concerns. Huge one, right? The controller is now responsible for doing all of those things, but if you break out the validator from the request, from the processor, you can test all those individual components easily. And that gets to the third point, which is that unit testing becomes easier, right? Because they all right, unit test, right? Right. So let's start with the request. That's the easiest thing. That's, the, that's, that's, the, that's our starting point, right? We just wanna make that easier. So we, we have this employee object and notice that it has a couple of concerns, right? It's not only concerned with representing the entity as it's stored in the database, but it also has, the, it also has a little bit of validation information on it, right? Because it's got those required attributes. It says the first name and last name are required. So it's responsible for validating itself, essentially. So we've got that being used for requests and the model and the validation are not separate things. So first thing we need to do, separate the entity from the model. So let's refactor. Let's look at that. So we've got our employee object, right? And we just wanna break it down. We wanna break out two things. We wanna make the request separate and we wanna make the uh, validation separate. So the first thing we do um, is discuss, well, you, you have to, of course, acknowledge what business rules apply here, right? Uh, in this case, we, don't, we wanna create employees of puzzle numbers. We don't wanna update them. We don't wanna get them. So we have what we call, we break this out. We have the employee create request. So this is the same thing, right? It's just a bag of properties, right? But it lacks some stuff. It lacks an ID, which you don't need for creates because it doesn't have an ID yet. Um, it, lacks, it, 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 it lacks any of the other internal information to your system that may be important, right? So we've now represented the one request as one object, okay? Put requests, uh, very similar, but that business rule again applies. You cannot, you should not, at least in this particular case, be able to update the puzzle number once it's inside of the database. And then of course you just have your delete request which just has a single ID, right? It has a property on it that's just one property. That, and, and it's important to break that out because now this request can be recognized by the system that were used as this class and therefore this request tied to this processor. We'll go over that in a little bit. So you're representing, you're breaking out your requests into different things, right? You're separating out your entity from your requests. And this looks like extra code and it is, but this is pat these are patterns that I follow all the time. And with a little bit of testing, a little bit of applied testing, you can make this work for you very easily. And I'll show you how, right? It's, it's, less ma it's more maintainable than you might think, right? It looks like a lot of code, but it really isn't. Another problem is, is it's clunky to validate. Um, validation using attributes is really something tied into MVC. Um, you can validate outside of MVC, of course, right? Using the data annotations namespace. Um, but it's not incredibly convenient. It's not incredibly convenient, and it's a little bit, Eh, a little bit funky, right? Uh, when you have code that looks like this, and I just Googled this uh, off of Stack Overflow, right? They said, well, if you wanna validate, uh, one of the problems with attribute validation is really complex validation rules, right? So when you have really complex validation rules, you then have to inherit from something, or implement something called iValidatable object. And it gives you a validate method that returns a list of um, validation results. It says this, particular property uh, has this error message associated with it. Zero validation results inevitably means that your object is valid. More than one means that, you're, that this object is invalid. But look at the code required to make this work. So we've got validator.tryValidate property, and you have to pass in this validation context, which, what, what, it, what does this mean? I'm giving it this null null is null. I thought null was bad. What if it has a null reference exception? I, it's not very clear. It's not very concise. Right? It's just, you, you, it's a little bit magical and magic does not make me happy. And then you give it the name of the member and you give it the results so that way it can actually add to the, mutate the validation result if there's a problem. So you have to write property, you have to write stuff like this, right? If you use the basic built-in way to do MVC. This is really messy. So we're gonna introduce thing two. So we've separated our requests from our validator. So again, this is an opinionated talk. I've got lots of opinions and I love fluent validation. Let me show you how it works. Fluent validation is a library. Um, I don't know who created it, but it's used in a lot of places and it's used to, to help you describe how a certain thing should be validated, okay? And it's a totally separate class, so that means it's not, the concern of validation falls outside of the request now. 
So we have our employee request, and I've just broken down the two properties that in this case we're trying to um, validate, and which is the first name and last name are required, right? So we can make that, we can make all of this magic go away. We can make that magic part of the magic ASP.NET validation process. We can make it so it's more understandable. And think about the other validation requirements. What if you have to query a database to say that, well, I can't create a new employee record with a PESL number for an employee that already exists, so now you're having to do database calls. And this way of doing it makes it very difficult to extract those services out, right? It's just, there's, there's a way to do it. You can actually get those services, but it's not convenient. So we wanna isolate our validation functionality, so we can do that using valid, fluent validation. And fluent validation is called fluent validation because it follows the fluent API ideal. It's not really a standard, it's just an ideal. But it's easier to describe exactly how your object is being validated. So you can say, rule four, first name, you say it's not empty. And not empty means not null, not an empty string, um, or not a default value, right? So if, it's, if you're trying to validate an integer, zero is an empty, considered an empty value. And uh, it tells you all that if you look at the IntelliSense. It, it's very well documented um, code. And then you can say, I want to send it with this message, right? And that's really cool because now you can actually do things if you have a global application. You can stick all these validation messages and resource strings and use them in that way, where it's very difficult to get that to work when you're using something like um, attribute validation. So it's very descriptive, and it's very minimal amount of code. All you have to do is inherit from abstract validator and then make your employee create request, that, that, that give it your employee create request as the type that it's trying to validate. So that way you get all this fluent stuff, you don't have to remember property names of strings, it just uses expressions to say, well, I wanna select the first name and do some rules on that. Pretty cool, right? Now, I just wanna see a show of hands. Who prefers this to what we just saw? Who prefers this? And it's fine, if you like this, I wanna know why, I really do. Okay, who prefers something like this how much easier is that to write and understand? And again, imagine if you had to inject services as part of this, right? If you had to, so you've, you've, you've well, let me say first that you've, you've separated your validation logic, you've separated it out from your validator. So now you can test your validator independently and you don't have to, you don't have to worry about the validation logic um, happening within the entity. And then you can test independently. Here's an example of a unit test that allows you to test that validator, right? So you write that, you test your validator, you're not worried about um, using the data annotation magic that's inside the .NET framework or ASP.NET Core, or .NET Core, to, in order to validate that object. It becomes very easy to understand, right? You just pass in an object, you call the validate method, and then you check to make sure that those results are there or not, right? It becomes super easy. And it really becomes important when you're talking about validators with dependencies, right? If you're trying to do an update, a, a put request, and you, or a delete request, and you want to delete that object or update it, you want to make sure that if you're issuing a delete request, that the, that the delete request that you're sending is actually valid, right? You want to make sure that that object actually exists. So if you, have a if you need dependency, all you do is add it to the constructor, right? And then when I, I'll get to the point where I show you where it all gets tied together. But ASP.NET Core, the way we have it configured in this particular example, is able to create this and inject this and, and inject it with the application DB context. So that way, excuse me, you can ensure that the object that you're trying to delete actually exists, right? Give it a nice little error message that says, this must exist in database. And you notice that I created a method that kind of looks fluent, right? It reads like English. It says, rule for this must, and you pass in a delegate or some kind of, you know, a function, right? And you say, and I just named it exist in database, so it must exist in database. So it becomes really easy to read, right? If you just follow the documentation, it shows you, for fluent validation, it shows you how its opinions on how to do all this stuff. Really, really neat, really awesome. So, what we've accomplished. So far, we've separated our request from our entity. Hugely important, right? Even if you keep your validation inside of that, that's still way better than putting your entity and tying your entity to your request, right? Those should be separate things because those are separate concerns. And they should be for security reasons, right? If you don't, overposting is a real thing. If you have an object that you don't want to update a property on, if you're just updating with the entity, then certainly somebody could update the PESL number, right? They could update some other internal property you don't want them to know. All they have to do is know about it, right? 
So that becomes, becomes very easy. You don't have to worry about that kind of thing. You've got, them, you've got the entity and the validator separated. That's probably more important than the validation separate from the request, but both are pretty important, right? So next, we got to extract those services. Controllers shouldn't be the one doing them. They just shouldn't. We've got a controller that is concerned with doing a lot of different stuff, right? It's concerned with validating. It's concerned with adding that employee to the context, right? And then it's concerned with saving it and then returning it, right? Whereas the controller should really just be a traffic cop, like I said. It should just say, you should go to this service to process that request. And once you've done process that request, I'll get that ID back and I'll do something with it, right? I'll send it back to the client and let them know that their entity has been created and here's the ID associated with it. So I want to separate our request handler from a controller. So this is opinion number, what is this? Opinion number three or four, introducing mediator. So mediator uh, was created by a guy you probably might have even seen him at this conference, a guy named Jimmy Bogard. He's not very well known for mediator. He's very well known for automapper. But mediator, I would argue, is almost a more important kind of concept, right? And I'll show you why. Mediator, mediator is only concerned with a couple of things. It's very lightweight API. It's concerned with making requests and having something that handles that request, okay? Mediator is simply really just an in-process delegator. It says, well, given this request, it's of this type, I know that this service handles this request. And you can mark that very explicitly. So you mark a, your, we can mark our create request. We can implement this uh, I request um, interface. And it simply says I request of int. That says that this is a request according to mediator and from that request, I should expect to return an integer, right? Which would be the integer of the created object, right? The ID of the created object. So this is it. There's no, there's no properties or methods to implement. This is simply, this interface is simply a marker. It's simply a marker to tell mediator, this is a thing that we can use to, re to process requests, or to this is a request that mediator can understand. So that's thing one, right? We're just adding, all we're doing is refactoring. We're just adding little bits of code here and there. Just trying to make things easier, right? That's the only thing that you should be, that it, the only thing that changes from the re create request is implementing that interface. So then what you can do is you can um, create a handler. Um, in this case, I call it employee create handler, right? I'm just naming it exactly what it's supposed to be. It's something that creates that employee. And what I can do is say, implement this thing right here, and it's called I request handler. And there's a couple of different ones. There's I request handler, if you like async await, I async request handler, and there's also an I cancelable async request handler if you want to be able to cancel those requests, right? Which is usually the one I implement is I cancelable, but for the sake of argument, I'm just doing this, the simplest one, right? Just showing you. And all it does, it says, this is a handler that takes in an employee create request and returns an int, right? So this is constrained such that the type of employee create request has to be an I request object. Mediator's got to be able to know that it's a request and that's how you tell it. So it's got a generic constraint to say, this, can, uh, this handler is specifically for the employee create request. And then you implement your handle method. So this is actually on the, this is actually on the uh, I request handler interface, right? The handle method. The thing has to be able to handle it and this is where you do it. This is the interface that dictates how you do it. So what we have here is we're simply just moving that logic that's inside of our constructor or inside of our controller and we're moving it to something else. We're moving it to something that can handle it, right? Something that's broken out. So you create your employee, you give it the first name and last name for the request, you add it to your database, you save the changes and you return the new ID, right? Nothing really, nothing really too crazy about it, but uh, this part kind of drives me crazy. Who likes, who likes manually setting properties from other things, right? Nobody does. If you've got 10 properties or 100 properties, this sucks. You don't want to do that. So I try, to, I try to save as much time as I can, right? Time is valuable. I'm a developer and I just want to get stuff done because I want my company to make money and I also want to go to lunch early. So you can do something like this, right? You, yeah, if you add AutoMapper as part of your process, then for simple requests, you can just say, hey, copy these properties from thing one to thing two, right? All you're doing is adding a dependency inside of, you're adding a dependency to your de in de dependency injection pipeline saying, this is the mapper library that I wanna use. In this case, it's auto mapper. And then it just says, hey, I just wanna create this new employee from this request, right? And you can tie those together in a couple of intelligent ways, which I will show you, which I will show you when I reveal my surprise, right? But this is a lot nicer. This is a lot nicer code, right? This is less code um, to write and therefore you're getting stuff done. There's the, map, there's the mapper dependency that we injected and here's us consuming it, right? Pretty simple. It's not, 
it's not it's nothing that's uh, really crazy or unusual or out there. And I certainly don't like to manually set properties, so AutoMapper is my AutoMapper is my friend. But we need still need to validate here first, right? We still want to validate this that this request is um, a good request, right? Because the handler. But really, in my opinion, and this, there's a couple of different opinions out there. In my opinion, this is an opinionated talk. My opinion, the handler should be the one that's getting the validators to actually validate that the request is worthwhile. So we can inject also into our control, into our thing, uh, the employee create request validators that we created, right? We can go through and validate, inject these, all these validators, and then we can spin through them and validate. Right, so that way the request can be can be the one responsible for, or the handler can be responsible for validating, as well. So the handler, but it, it's a little different, right? The validator still sits in a separate place, but the handler's still using those validators, right? So that's a good thing. So benefits, independently testable, right? We've isolated all of our functionality. We isolate, isolated our requests from our from our validators. Validators can be independently testable. Our handlers can be independently testable. And we don't have to worry about making sure that the shape of data comes through from a web API or can the controller to actually, um, we don't have to worry about, you know, newing up a controller and adding in all those things, at, at making sure that the, the response that you're getting is the response. You can just test these independently, right? And then it becomes reusable. And reusability is awesome, right? Because if you need to, if you need to re-implement this or put this in a separate API, it just becomes natural. You put it in a separate library, you consume that library, and you've done a good job. So let's put it all together. So the dependency injection handles the dependencies, which of course get injected inside of our services and our validators, especially application DB context being at the at the head of that. Mediator is the thing handling requests and responses, right? So it knows about requests, it knows about handlers and that's all it does, right? Mediator handles all of that, all of the plumbing under the hood, as long as you've put it in your dependency injector, right? And then the controller does what it does best, which is represent HTTP requests. Well, the requests themselves, objects themselves represent the requests, but controller can handle those, right? You can create a controller and you could be very thin, right? If you went to Jimmy's talk earlier on domain-driven design, um, he, did, he, demonstra he showed this exact same thing on the screen where he basically showed a controller and said, look at how simple this controller is. It's just responsible for handling HTTP requests. Um, rule four is I would use a better dependency injection container. How many people use dependency injection in their day-to-day? -day? Okay, good amount of you. So I like Autofac. Um, obviously, you could do this with an inject or a structure map or whatever, you, whatever dependency injection framework you use, likely they have a tie-in with ASP.NET Core, and it's probably pretty convenient to use. So the auto thing about Autofact, the thing about the um, dependency injection framework that's built into ASP.NET Core is it's very low API surface, and that's a good thing. Um, but Autofact allows you to have more power, right? I don't want to register all of those individual services that I've created. Because you can use Autofact to scan an assembly and say, I want to register all of these services that, and I want to register all them all and say, I just want... The, they, I want them to be injected into my pipeline just as whatever interfaces they implement, right? So if you have 100 plus services, you're not registering them individually, you can just say Autofac, register them all, right? And that's one line, that's just a couple lines of code. So Autofac is really nice for that reason. Because if you're creating all these handlers and all these validators, you certainly want to be able to consume them, but you don't want to write a lot of plumbing code to do it. So this is what that might look like, right? So this is the same thing that we saw before in our startup.cs. We have our configure services method, but down here we just use a little bit of uh, autofact magic to say, hey, I'm gonna create what's called a container builder, and I'm going to add in all of the types inside of my service assembly, whatever that may be. I just wanna add them into the dependency injection pipeline as their implemented interfaces, okay? It's very simple. And then of course, the other thing you have to do um, add, add mediator to that, to that pipeline, and then inject it inside of the controller, because now the controller, again, no longer responsible for processing requests. Mediator does all of that. So you inject it inside your controller, and your mediate, and then controller says, I don't know what to do with this. Mediator does, which is great. Finally, the controller itself. So this is what one method might look like, right? This might be our post method. It's very simple. You get a request. You've got your employee create request. Notice that I'm not using the entity to send that request, excuse me, and then um, mediator, you pass it to mediator and you say, hey, handle this request. Mediator will only handle requests for, rec for objects that implement I request. So if you don't, if you forget to implement it, mediator will certainly remind you. 
And then it's, not it's no longer responsible for actually processing that request, right? Mediator is. Mediator is the middleman. And that's a good thing, right? Keeps everything independent. So then the controller, what it does, what it does best. It receives the request, sends it off for processing, and then once you've processed it, it says, well, I know what this is. You've created an object, so I'm going to send you back the ID because that's what you want to do. And then, of course, if you throw validator, validation exception um, inside from your handler, then you can return bad request, which is, another, again, another thing that um, media or, uh, ASP.NET core controllers are good at. Um, notice that I have this little weird extension method, convert to model state. It's just something that I put together. I don't have an example in this particular thing, but it essentially just converts the validation exception from inside Fluent Validator um, to something that can be consumed by bad request, right? And that's pretty simple to do. It's just a bunch of for each, it's just a for each loop. So that's that. So I have a few tips for you. More, most important thing is to create repeatable patterns. Um, it's, 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 it's nice because if you're talking to a junior developer, you're a senior developer or mid-level developer, right? And you're mentoring the next generation of junior developers. It's really nice when you can just hand them a formula and say, hey, you can imp implement this request, test, right? Implement the validator, test that validator, write a test for that validator, implement the handler, write the tests for that handler, and then tie it to a controller. And that's really powerful because repeatable patterns allow your junior developers to be more productive sooner. And then they're able to understand it better because they're able to look at something and see how it's all broken out. And you can create systems that look really nice because you've got individual components, right? So it becomes easy for Jerry Jr. developer to understand. It's great for senior developers because much of the same thing, but then they can take that pattern and teach it. So uh, I have a link up here. If you guys want to go ahead and click on it, I'll wait. No, I'm kidding. But if you go to the slides, you can go to this link. Uh, this is a link to Jimmy Bogard's blog um, who, where he actually breaks this down into more complete example. Next thing is to write tests for everything. Yeah, yeah, blah, 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 unit test joke. I already said that joke. So, um, but it's, it's helpful to write tests. It, it, it really is. It will, make your, it will make your software better because it's really not about software that works today. It's making sure that the software stays working as people, as people move on in their lives, right? If somebody deletes a line of code, you want to make sure that that code works reliably. I'm not going to try to drill this into your head. A lot of you probably know the value of unit testing already. Um, if you don't unit test, at least integration test, right? At least make sure that all the pieces work. Um, if we had to sprint through a project quickly, and I said, well, let's just write integration tests for everything because unit tests are really nice, but on their own, they're not nearly as valuable as an integration test. So what we ended up doing was creating something that hit that API and then just made sure that if we didn't send the right data, it sent back a certain HTTP request. So that's really valuable, really important. Um, another practice that I think is kind of important is keep versions separate. Um, if you look at my previous art, uh, the article for that I did for the previous, the prequel to this talk, uh, or if you watch the talk, you'll see that I say that you should version your API, especially if you have external consumers. Um, so I like to keep versions in separate places, right? I like to, I may reuse some of my services in my new, con, in my new, um, in my new version of my API. Um, but I, if I'm versioning, I'm probably changing some of those services as well. So I usually like to keep those in just separate libraries. I'll have a version one service library or something like that, right? And that library contains the handlers, the validators, and the requests. And then I just inject those into my pipeline and it becomes all good. So I like to do that, but if you don't, it's not that big a deal. Um, so what are the concerns for the approach like this, right? So this is a nice approach, but still has some moving pieces, right? Everything has, everything's a give and take, right? The software engineering is not black and white. There's compromises we make every day. Um, for an application, if your boss tells you to make a five-page ASP.NET application uh, with 10 different kinds of requests, and you're like, well or well, like two or three, right? And you're like, well, I, I really need to use Mediator and I need to validate these requests with fluid validation. Or if it's just a really simple, non-critical business like website, you probably don't need to do this, right? It's not all necessary. It's not all important to do all of these things. Um, there's a learning curve involved, right? There's libraries to learn. It's not just all boiled into ASP.NET. It's not super convenient like everything, right? You have to pick and choose certain opinions. Your team may not like Autofac. It may like Ninject. It may love attribute validation, which is useful. It is useful. Um, so you kind of have to pick and choose your opinions because there is a learning curve involved in all of these libraries and kind of how they fit together. Um, but at the end of the day, 
It's really good if you are trying to rely on a business critical system. If this is a business critical system that makes your, that makes your company money, and you really should consider it. Uh, medium to large applications are really where it's the sweet spot. This is where this, it's kind of like implementing types. If you went to my type system in JavaScript talk yesterday, it's basically the same thing. It just helps your system scale from a code perspective. So that way, as you add people to your team, as you're doing more things, your team has a repeatable pattern that it can use in order to better create web applications. So I have one more thing. Last week, um, I was kind of, I accepted a new job. So last week was kind of a week off for me. And, um, and I got an email from Raul, Raul. And Raul said, uh, Spencer, I, I love your talk. They watched this talk, um, the video of this talk. They said, I love your talk. Uh, and I really, but I, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff here. I'd really love, and a code example, I'd really love you to put it together. And this wasn't the first time I got a request like this. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. So on the plane ride over and part of my part days last week, I put together a code example. And it's pretty cool. I call it recess. Uh, I don't think it translates very well, but recess is like a period after lunch where kids play, right? It's kind of the rest time, and this is a rest talk. Uh, uh, so yeah, it doesn't translate very well, but I called it recess because that's what I wanted to call it. So if you go to rest.schneids.net, in fact, I have a little time, so I'm just going to show you the link, and I'm going to show you the repo, all right? We're not going to spend a ton of time doing this. You go to rest.schneids.net, and you scroll down, you go down to the bottom, and you see Recess, an example API project for ASP.NET Core. You click on it, and it gives you a GitHub repo where I've literally taken all of these opinions and implemented them for you. So now you have a blueprint um, for how to make web applications. Um, this is going to make me sound like a hypocrite, but there's still a few things I have to do, like <sighs> write unit tests. I haven't, te I haven't written them yet. Uh, I threw this together, literally I finished it on the plane, and then I was like, well, I've got to prepare for my workshop, right? So if you scroll down, you'll kind of see why I created the project the libraries I used, um, as well as how to kind of get it started, right? You'd literally clone the repo. If you have ASP.NET Core, you run .NET Restore, you open it inside of Visual Studio, whatever, and then you go .NET Run, and then just experiment. Try to make some GET requests and some POST requests against these APIs that I have. Um, and then it shows you, like, kind of the, it breaks down basically what I talked about, kind of the ideals for this test, right? So you can get that um, by going to rest.schneids.net, right? So go there, get the code sample, download it, star the repo, file issues if I screwed something up, right? I want to fix it. I, wanna, I, I figure if I put it out there, now I'm responsible for maintaining it at least a little bit. Uh, if you have contributions, contribute to it. I don't care. It's a great code example. I was really excited to share that with you because um, I think it could be useful to you. So anyways, um, thank you. I, uh, again, our relationship doesn't end here, right? Find me in the halls. I'll be outside more than happy to answer questions about this talk. Uh, get, find me on, sh on Twitter at Schneidenbach. If you go to my website, there's ways to email me. Raul emailed me out of the blue, right? I've never met Raul. He just said, can you help me? And I said, okay, why not? So at any time, just email me your questions, comments, concerns. Tell me if I screwed something up or tell me why I'm, my opinions are wrong. I'm happy to hear it all. Again, thank you very much. My name is Spencer Schneidenbach. It's been a pleasure to be here in Poland. Uh, enjoy the rest of DevConf and have a great day. Thank you very much.